talk to you about why being generous, uh, it's certainly holy, it's certainly right, it's certainly righteous, it's certainly important, uh, it certainly fits into the concept of stewardship, but I want to talk about why it's genius, why it's smart. I will say right up front, generous people are very smart. Miserly people are very stupid. The word miser, same root word as miserable. And uh, this has been an amazing journey for me. I did not grow up as a Christian. My uh, parents were school teachers. They were very moral. Uh, my mom gave me a quarter. I went to a, a non-Bible teaching church that was very irrelevant, and I put it, you know, as the plate was passed. And uh, my view of people who were generous, they had two characteristics. Either they were very, very wealthy, they sold a big business, they won the lotto, they're very rich, they have a lot, they can be generous. Or they were super holy. Uh, when I grew up, it was like Mother Teresa and Billy Graham. Like if you had a really big heart for God and were super virtuous, then you could be generous. And growing up, I knew two things. Number one, I wasn't rich, and number two, I wasn't holy. And, um, and that framed my thinking. Now, I, I learned you shouldn't be miserly and you shouldn't be greedy. I wanted to be kind and I wanted to be nice and I wanted to be unselfish, to be lavish, lavishly generous. That was like for a different group of people. That's for some other category. And all that changed when I met a man that I call the amazing John Saville. It's my first pastorate. I'm 28 years old. It's rural Texas. I grew up in the suburbs, and I land in this little town of under 3,000. It doesn't have a stoplight. John owns a CPA firm downtown in this beautiful building, and I find that all the elders in this, it wasn't a mega church, it was a mini church. There were 35 people in this church. 34 of them, I would learn two years later, were all related. <laughs> and I would learn there were seven other either full-time or part-time student pastors in the last five years before me. They didn't let me in on that. And so it was a real learning experience. After about a year there, and I'm young and zealous, and I played basketball in college and played ball overseas, and so I'm a young, athletic, energetic, we've got to make a difference in this town. And the chairman of the board is John Saville, who is old, comes to Christ late, had been broke a couple times, was now very rich, has a CPA firm downtown, and after watching me for a year, says, I'd like you to come down and have lunch with me. By the way, you have to wear a coat. So I only have one coat. So I get in my one coat in my non-air-conditioned car at 98 degrees. I drive to downtown. I figure out this big building. I get an elevator that's all glass. I go all the way to the top. It opens up. There's this huge wood paneling, and I learned the entire floor is Savile Dodgen CPA. Mr. Savile will be right with you. He comes out, Chip, good to see you. Now, he's about mid-70s. He's had severe uh, cancer on his face, so it's all been burned off. He's kind of kooky. Um, I mean, he is. He was a kooky guy. He, he had this yellow, bright Cadillac that said, I'm a fool for Jesus. Whose fool are you? <laughs> I mean, he was the epitome of uncool. Um, and so we get in the elevator, and, you know, he's my boss, chairman of the elders, and we go up another bunch of floors, and the doors open, and it's complete glass, glass racquetball courts. Uh, we sit down at this restaurant. There's no numbers. I've never been in a restaurant with no numbers. I mean, how do you know what to order if you don't know what it costs? And a, a waiter comes here, a waiter comes here, and we have this lavish lunch, and I'm very uncomfortable. And John says, I've, I've observed you for about a year, and I have a proposition. You don't have to do it, but I'd like to make a deal. And he took a small box out, and he played the box in front of me. I can still remember. It was a, it was a little box, and he opened it up, and there was a brownish-red checkbook in it. And I opened it up, and he said, take a look. And it said, Pastor's Discretionary Fund. And he said, uh, I have a desire, Chip. He said, I've gone broke twice. I didn't come to Christ until I was in my early 60s. You live in a place with all these needs, hurting people, poor people, unwed mothers, all kind of issues. I have a heart to help them. I have money. You have opportunity. Here's what I'd like you to do, but you don't have to do it. I'd like you to take this checkbook. Uh, and then I went to the back, and it said had $5,000 deposited. He said, I'd like you to take this checkbook and carry it with you every day. And then I'd like you to walk around and be my eyes and be my ears, and wherever you think I would want to help someone, just help them. And in three or four months, we'll do this maybe three, maybe four times a year. You'll come back from lunch, 
and you give me the checkbook and the ledger, and you walk through and you tell me what you did with my money to love people. Well, he's the boss, and he's kooky. <laughs> and I'm thinking, so, you know, what am I going to do? So John had a desire, you see, on the front of his notes, and that was to help people. I had an opportunity, and we made a deal. And so I'm driving back in my unair conditioned car, sweating now, taking off this crazy one jacket that I own, and thinking, now I'm under all this pressure. What am I going to do? What if I mess up? Who am I supposed to give it to? I don't know what to do. And, and so finally, okay, God, I'll do whatever I want. So when I walk in my house, I always put my keys, my wallet, and everything here. And now the checkbook went there. The wallet goes here. Watch goes here. Keys go here. And that checkbook went in my back pocket. And I carried it around. Three days later, I'm in a, the equivalent of an Albertsons or a Safeway, and I'm checking out, and there's a lady that looks a little distressed, and she has, you know, two kids in the cart and one running around. And if you've ever been to a checkout where she's trying to figure out what she has to put back because she doesn't have enough money to pay for everything she got. And, you know, I'm starting to leave, and you can see this scene brewing, and the kids are running around, and, you know, you know how God gives you sort of a prompting, something's wrong here, so I sort of lean in, and... I listen, and, and I'm thinking, shoot, I don't know what John, who he wants to help, but this looks like a good one first shot. I said, excuse me, what's going on? And I find out that her husband had abandoned her, uh, took the car, emptied their bank account. Uh, she has three kids, and she's going to drive about six or seven hours to her folks and try and figure out what to do with her life. And I said, you know what, why, why don't you, is this just what you can afford? And she, you know, that look was like... And I said, tell you what, I said to the cashier, can you hang on right here? Let's just put all this back. And, and I said, this is really weird. And I don't know, you kind of think I'm weird, but why don't we think about what you really need? And I started walking aisle by aisle. I said, do you, you think you might need some of these? And we just started filling carts. <laughs> and you need to think about one of these, and you need to think one of these. And I, we, if we need to get another cart. And so and then we got to the checkout, and she looked at me like, you know, is, am I in a movie? What's going on? And, and uh, so I... I whip out my John Savile checkbook. <laughs> How much is this? I don't care. <laughs> Do it, you know? And I'm feeling like instead of like all this responsibility, that was fun. So we get out to the car. She's crying. Thank you so much. I get a chance to share the gospel. And I, she's getting in the car, a little kind of station wagon with these three kids. And, and you know, I got another one of those promptings from the Holy Spirit because I saw this look on her face. I said, you don't have enough gas money to make it to your mom and dad's, do you? She goes, no. I said, see that 7-Eleven over there? Pull that car over there. This is getting more fun all the time, you know. <laughs> Fill her up, you know, and I write another check, you know, and, and I mean, um, all I can tell you was three things happened. Uh, number one, uh, rarely a day went by that I didn't think of John. Every need raised the question, I wonder what John would want me to do. I mean, I've got nothing in common. He's kooky. He really was. Very odd. Um, we had nothing in common. I'm into athletics, and he's, I mean, a CPA, bean counting. Uh, he was formal. I was loose and spontaneous. But every day, I would think, every situation, every need became an opportunity to look through his eyes. And an amazing thing happened. John and I became best friends. I don't mean good friends, I mean best friends. I mean, I started asking him about, he'd been through some pain. And I asked him about, what about my kids? And I got this issue in my marriage. Um, and then about every quarter, I would drive down. And we would have lunch, and I got sort of used to it. And, and he would say, hey, there's no numbers here. Have you ever had steak and lobster at the same time? I said, I don't even know what a lobster is, man. I'm middle class at best. He goes, you got to try this. And so, you know, they bring all this stuff, and we'd have like a two and a half hour lunch. And he goes, okay, tell me about this one. Tell me about the $243. What's this? Oh, man, there's this crazy guy, and they cut off their electricity. And I went out to the house, and he had eight dogs and 33 cats, and his wife had cancer. And this is what we did. And then I would tell the story, and then John, he's kooky. So he would embarrass me. I mean, this is this very formal place. And he'd lean back his head and real loud go, praise the Lord. And I'm like this young wannabe hip cool pastor and I just wanted to get underneath the table. You know, you know, that is not how you reach people, John. Don't do that. And uh, 
And, and John, so the second thing that happened is I strangely became more meticulous about balancing his checkbook than my own. Some of you are like my wife, and you're very important to the entire world. You have mild OCD. If, if your checkbook is off or your bank account or something's wrong or something's wrong technically, I mean, you cannot rest until you get it right. There's other parts of the population are more like me. I get a bank statement. If it's within 20 bucks or so, that's good enough. It'll take me three hours to figure out what it is, and so heck, if it's within 20 bucks, my time's worth more than, you know, 7.78 an hour or whatever it is. Well, you know what? You can do that with your own money, but when you've got $5,000 and you're spending it and you're taking it to a CPA, you do not say, ah, you know, I think I'm a couple hundred bucks off. It doesn't matter. I mean, it's like his money. And, you know, my wife would laugh, and she'd go, how come you're so good with his money and kind of loose with ours? I said, well, I'm working on it, babe. And I would, I would show that, and then after I would have a lunch or two, and then something strange would happen. I'd get my bank account, I'd have all the checks that I wrote, and I'd be back up to $5,000. Well, that old John, he's a sneaky guy. He'd just keep refilling it. And I was there for eight years. And so for seven years, John Savile and I became amazing friends. I became very meticulous about where his money went and my money went. And um, he bought me extravagant lunches. And uh, can you start to get anybody here thinking there might be a parallel? Anybody thinking that generosity might not be about oughts and shoulds and exactly this percent or that percent? I didn't do anything righteous. I wasn't a martyr. I wasn't earning anybody's favor. Here's a thought. I'll read iterate it a little bit later, but this is the greatest breakthrough concept for me with generosity. Generosity is the gateway to intimacy with God. Generosity is the gateway. It's the channel. It's the PVC pipe to intimacy with God. 50% of the people where I go to church do not give anything to the church. 50% of the people of all churches don't give anything to the church. Christians nationwide, I think we're up to a, a whopping, what is it, 2.4 or 2.7 percent. That's the average gift among evangelical believers. We, we have so missed generosity. We've so missed what it's all about. And so I want to talk to you about how genius it is. Uh, the, the root word for, for genius in Latin comes from the word that means to produce. It later came to have the idea of something that was high quality and excellent, and then someone who was, you know, very, very intelligent. And so Einstein was a genius in physics. Uh, then when you look at the word generous, it, it has a very interesting root word. In Hebrew, it has, I mean, it has the idea of something to water to overflowing. Uh, Proverbs eleven twenty five 25 says, the one who waters will himself be watered. He'll prosper. Literally, you'll be made fat. There'll be abundance. When you water others, you'll be saturated to overflowing. In 1 Timothy 6, the, the word generous is used, and it has the idea of ready to distribute, like ready at every moment, be looking through a lens to say, how could I help someone with my time or my energy? Or, Where's there a need? Or I have plenty. How could I? It's living with this lens that John taught me about where giving is an adventure. And it's not simply about your money. It's about your life. It's about your time. It's about... I have a heavenly father who has a lot more than $5,000 with unlimited resources deposit in my spiritual account, and he's asking me every day to say, hmm, I wonder who Jesus wants to love today. I wonder who he wants to hug today. I wonder who he wants to just buy a cup of coffee for. I wonder who he wants me to just sit down next to and say, hey, how's your day going? I wonder who he wants me to just pay for the bus fare of the people behind me. I wonder who he wants me to say, you know, I've been saving, 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 and I think it's got a hook in me. I'm going to write a really big check or make a big donation just to free my heart. And so what I want you to do is you open the notes. I want to walk through just a little bit of a teaching time here. And I want to give you some reasons why being generous is genius. Not simply right and moral, but it is genius give you four quick reasons. Reason number one, generosity changes and enriches our lives. I mean, Jesus said it, it's more blessed, right? You'll be happier. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Proverbs 11, same idea. 
there's a general principle that it changes our lives. When I give and when you give, don't you have a good feeling inside? This is the ultimate win-win proposition. When you give, there's like this, ooh, good feeling. When you give, you have this good feeling. God has this good feeling because you're being like him. Whoever receives it, they have this good feeling, and it helps them. And the scripture says that when it helps them, and they know it comes from you, it comes from God, they thank him. It changes people's lives. It's one of those axiomatic things you can ever do. I remember uh, studying, I was doing a study on the attributes of God, and when Moses comes and asks God, he says, show me your glory. And G.I. Packard's book, Knowing God, he's got a great paragraph or two about the key words there when God describes who he is, and the root word of his goodness, at the core of it means his, his generosity. The most generous being in the universe is God. Tozer, in his little book, The Knowledge of the Holy, talks about God's goodness. And he said, the whole, the whole of mankind would be changed if we could but believe that God, although exalted in majesty and glory, is eager to be friends with us. God is good and generous, not because of something you do, but because of who he is. He finds happiness. He finds blessedness. He finds joy in the giving of his children. He wants to bless you. We think God's withholding. Number one, it changes you. Number two, it connects you to other people. Generosity connects us with others. There's something about because wherever your money goes, your heart follows, if you want to be connected to people, generosity does that. Uh, I pastored in Santa Cruz, and if you've been up that way, it's right there on the coast. And if you've ever been to downtown Santa Cruz, to say it is a unique environment, you know, the weirdest people in the world live in Santa Cruz. I mean, we have the biggest homeless population and street musicians, and uh, it's the people, all the hippies who, you know, thought the 60s never left, they just bring their Volkswagen vans and peace signs, and, and I loved it. I was there for 12 and a half years. And um, because I have four kids, and they're all grown now, but they weren't grown, and uh, I, I realized that Early in the morning, I needed to get done what only I could do, and that was spend significant deep time with God and study the scriptures before I got into all the work in life. And so over the time, I ended up going to bed at a fairly early time for me. And so I'd get up at, you know, 4 or 4.30, and there was a little Cambodian coffee shop across from the 7-Eleven. I mean, a little hole in the wall. And they would open at 4.30 because they cook all the bagels and the donuts. And they knew me, so they would put out these coffee things, and it was, you know, like French roast that kind of really like Steve Smooth. And so I'd get there about 4.45, and just, I mean, three little tables, and then I would sit there, and there was the 5 o'clock group and the 5.20 group and the group of guys that come over and talk. I mean, like clockwork. And, uh, you know, I would come in and learn my few little Cambodian words and get a cup of coffee and sit. And then there was this homeless guy. He usually slept in his car or slept out in the grass. And if you've ever seen people that have done super deep, hard drugs, I mean... You know, they have kind of the scarred look, and he hadn't bathed probably in a number of months. And his hair was kind of like this. And, and I would get there, and he'd get there after me, and he would sit like this, and he would stare in a stupor. And he's the kind of person that if you were walking there by yourself, you would wonder, if he's armed, I'm in trouble. Have you ever walked by someone, and they just look scary? I mean, he, he looked really scary. And then, you know, you know, you try and be nice. You know, I'm a Christian. Hi. Uh, how's it going? Nothing, just, I mean, months and months and months. And, and so I'm, he would sit at this table, and I'd sit in the corner away from people, and I'm studying and studying, and I've been praying for this guy, praying for this guy. And so eventually, uh, I say, uh, I, I did see he drank coffee. I was getting a refill. I said, hey, uh, can I get you a cup of coffee and a, a bagel? I'm going to get a bagel or something. I've been here a couple hours. No, I mean it. Hey, like, I mean, you, you want some coffee? And I got this deeply passionate emotional response. I said, okay. You know, so I, I get him a cup of coffee and I get a bagel and I, I put that over there and I sit that down and I mean, I mean, I didn't get a nod. I didn't get a thank you. And I just went and sat down and about 45 minutes later, he looks back at me and said, uh, do you see the sunrise? 
you know, because the, the window was right out from both of us. I said, I said, yeah. Do you know what that is, those two? I'm thinking, and I didn't know, I didn't even know you spoke. <laughs> I said, no. That's Venus and that's Mars. There'll only be four more days like this. And I came around, I sat down, I said, what are you talking about? I learned his name was Mike. I learned he was in construction. I learned where and how his kids were taken away from him. I learned how he got injured on a job. I learned how his whole life had fallen apart. I learned he's a master craftsman and a really smart guy. And the next morning he came around and said, look, you know, Venus, this is what happened here. And he started to explain astronomy to me. And I got so excited, I went to the guys who sat over here. I said, hey, guys, come over here. This guy's name's Mike. And these three or four guys, because, you know, you hang out together every morning. I said, look at this. I mean, the sky was pink, just pink, and these bright stars. For a buck and a half of coffee and a 99-cent bagel, a little act of generosity, God connected Mike and I. I, I moved away. I came back, you know, a year or two later. I had to stop by the coffee shop. There's Mike. He gets up. All hugs are not pleasant experiences, but they do good for your heart. And his non-bathed body, and he just hugs me. And uh, we've got to talk about his kids and our sister. And here, do you hear? Generosity changes you. Generosity connects you to people. And third, does this sound smart or not? This is smart. This is genius. Generosity helps you invest in what matters most. Jesus is going to talk in um, Matthew 6, and I want you to kind of get the structure in your mind. I know you're in Bible school, and I'll go through this fairly quickly. But I want you to understand as I read this that there's a couple things going on in this passage. Number one, there are um, two treasures, there are two eyes, and there's two masters. So there's two treasures, there's two eyes, and there's two masters. The structure is he's going to give a negative command explanation, then a positive command explanation, a timeless principle, and then he's going to roll it out and show them how it plays out in their culture. Follow along. Negative command. Do not store up, literally stop storing up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Underline the word for yourselves. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Timeless principle. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, he's not saying it's wrong to save. He, the, the store up for yourselves has to do with greed, hoarding, false security. And what's the reason? What's, what's Jesus' motivation? He says, it's a bad investment. It won't last. It's not secure. It's dangerous. It can't come through. So don't store up for yourselves treasure that won't deliver what you think it's going to deliver. It won't, the fame, the success, the money, the security, whatever you think it's going to deliver, it's very, very temporal and it's very uncertain. And where I live, you see that all the time. Companies go public, administrative assistants are millionaires one day. The bubbles burst. It's really interesting to watch these very high homes and watch their Audis and their Mercedes and their 7 Series BMWs being taken away by the repo people. People who are worth millions and millions of dollars. He said, this is for your protection. But he says, store up, underline in your notes for yourselves. We always get this idea of stewardship, like I'm giving something up and I'm a martyr and I'm more holy and, you know, this is what God really wants and I guess if he really wants it. And see, if you give out of that, then you'll become self-righteous and you'll become a jerk and you'll become arrogant and we won't like you and unbelievers won't like you either. You're not doing God any favors when you're generous. When you're generous, you're just being smart. Just being smart. You're being wise. Store up for yourselves what? Treasure in heaven. Of all places in the world at Biola, you ought to believe what? Is there a heaven and a hell? Yes or no? I mean, yes or no? Yes. And, and now, by, by the way, it's, that's getting sketchy around evangelical circles. Is there absolute truth or not? 
The biggest cultural issues in our day have nothing to do with sexuality and everything to do with hermeneutics. Everything to do with hermeneutics. If there's a real heaven and there's a real Jesus and he says store up for who? For you. There's a real heaven, there's real rewards, there's a real future. There is this, C.S. Lewis says, there's this line called eternity. And inside that line, there's this little inch called time. And inside this little tiny inch called time, there's a tiny little dot that represents all of history. And inside that little dot, you take a super powerful magnifying microscope, and there's an incy-wincy dot inside that little dot, and that's your 70 or 80 years. And you either live for the line, you live for the little dot. Smart people live for the line. I would store up things for me. Why? Because wherever your treasure goes, your heart follows. So if you don't give, if you're not generous, if you don't give the first and the best, you can raise your hands, you can talk about Jesus, you can get a theological education, you can have dreams for ministry. I got news for you. You don't love God like you think you do. Hey, are you ready? Period. Period. The clearest evidence of your love relationship with anyone is wherever your treasure goes. Period. We've got this so soft and we haven't taught people. Why? Because wherever your heart it follows your treasure. So you don't give to earn, you don't give, and God won't love me if I don't do this or I don't do that. He's trying to protect you. He wants your heart where it's his, and he longs to bless you. And it's probably the clearest ways that we ever tell God that we actually believe in him, that we have faith. Because if I don't give, why? It's fear. I'm afraid if I give and help someone else, there won't be enough for me. So I'm really saying, God, your plan doesn't work because I don't think you're able. I don't think you're not able or you don't really care about me. So I can't be generous. If you can't be generous, you can't be like Jesus. Although he's rich, he made himself poor that we could be rich. So he says, this is how you invest in what matters most. Then notice the passage goes on, and now he's going to develop he says, a little explanation for their day. He says, the eye, what's the eye? The eye is our, provides direction and guidance. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, put a box around good, your whole body would be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, put a box around bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you hate the one and love the other, or you be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. The word good here is haplos, two different meanings in the New Testament. It has the idea of singularity and loyalty, or of generosity, depending on the context. If your eye is good, if it's singular, if there's no idols, if it's God, then you're filled with light. If your eye is bad, poneros, same word is used for the evil one. And it was a Jewish idiomatic expression. The evil eye was a miserly, greedy person. Because he's saying, look, there's two treasures. Treasure in heaven or treasure here. There's two eyes. You look at it through a devotion to Jesus and a good God who is generous. And you're the conduit of that generosity. You've got the checkbook of Jesus, not John Savile, in your back pocket. And it's your time and your talent and your treasure. And you get up every day saying, Lord, who, who do you want to love today? Who, 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 do you, who do I get to help today? Is it the person on the bus? Is it the person behind me? Is it the person at Starbucks? Is, wow, is it the lady that looks like me and she lost her best friend? Is, as I was praying this morning, is it this person who you just brought him to mind and I'm going to text him this morning? And it's an outward focus, singular devotion. Your eye is good. And so the light and the love of Christ, it goes through you. We have unconsciously flipped that. God, where are you? Don't you care about me? Don't you know about my school debts? I'm still single and I've been praying and I want someone right away. <laughs> you know, I went to the lunchroom and no one came down and sat next to me. You know, when you have a generous heart and spirit, I'll tell you what, the spirit and the love of Christ begins to flow through you. But when you have a bad eye, when it's dark, when it's about me and when it's greedy, and we don't, we don't say that stuff. We don't say it enough. We can be full of darkness. We can completely miss out. 
And what we'll do is we'll believe the lies that, that money can bring success and significance and fame and those things will deliver. Now, money's not bad. It just can't deliver these things. It's a tool that God wants to use. The final is generosity frees our hearts. Verse 21. Because you have two masters. I, I bet I was a pastor for at least 15 years, maybe 20. It's really embarrassing because it's been over 30 now. And if someone would have said, what's the opposite of God? I would say Satan. It's not what Jesus said. Jesus said there's two gods. He doesn't say there's Yahweh, the triune God, and there's Satan. He says there's God and there's mammon. Energized by the enemy, for certain. But see, where your time and where your energy goes, where your thoughts go, what drives you, that's what you worship. And according to Jesus, there's option A, me, and option B, mammon. And the only way to break your heart free is to be generous. And so I don't know where you're at on this. I didn't grow up as a Christian, and I remember I was in a college ministry, and I, I made this huge, I mean, I was a like a dollar, you know, a dollar. And then if I felt really good about myself or about God, it was a five. And then when I, you know, in the offering, and then later on I was a school teacher, and, you know, I gave a $20 bill now and then, you know. <laughs> Not a lot of people holy like me, but there needs to be a few of us. I mean, that's literally how I looked at it. And I remember a Japanese couple talking about what was going on in Japan. And you'll laugh. Of course, $5 went a lot farther. I started writing a check for $5 every month to help someone outside of me. And then I got around a group of people that were generous, and 10% was like training wheels. And I watched people give over and above. And, and then I got to meet a man who, when he got married,